Great to have you back here on The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. Now let's look back in history, the 11th of March, and I'm going back to the year 2011. This particular event, um, it's two different things, you know, that happened on the same day, mm -hmm. but we're focusing on one of them, which was the nuclear disaster. But it started with an earthquake and a tsunami that um, happened in Japan on this day in 2011. Um, it was the largest earthquake ever recorded in Japan, uh, caused by massive devastation. And, of course, the ensuing tsunami that occurred uh, decimated m some parts of northeastern Honshu. Um, on top of the already, of course, uh, horrific destruction and loss of life, the natural disaster then led to a nuclear disaster at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. I'm trying to, I, I hope this is not, uh, <laughs> this is, I'm, I'm trying to pronounce it in a Japanese way. The Fukushima disaster is considered the second worst nuclear disaster in history, uh, forcing the relocation of more than 100,000 people. It is only second only to the Chernobyl disaster in Ukraine uh, that happened in uh, 1986. Uh, during the emergency, each of the three operational nuclear reactors at the Fukushima plant sh were shut down successfully. And of course, crews searched the rubble for survivors. The nation reeled from the earthquake and the ensuing tsunami. The nuclear disaster unfolded over the course of several days. And uh, of course, uh, more reactors continued to explode. Reactor 1 and Reactor t uh, 3 exploded um, on the 12th of March, which was the next day, and of course on the 14th respectively, prompting the government to evacuate everyone within a 20-kilometer radius. Another explosion in the building housing Reactor 2 happened on the 15th of March and re uh, released even more radiation. Um, at the time that you know all these things happened, there were no deaths you know that were initially attributed to the react the um, um, nuclear disaster. Uh, most of the deaths, the thousands of people who lost their lives, were mostly from the earthquake and the tsunami. Um, about eight thousand people, I believe, um, eighteen thousand people, sorry, um, you know, were on record to have died. And so they they basically estimated that many many years after would be when they would be able to tell. Uh, the effect of the nuclear disaster and the release of that much radiation into the atmosphere um, in Japan at that time. Um, unfortunately, that's the way that it plays out. You may not see the effects of um, high level of radiation poisoning um, immediately. It, you, you know, it eventually shows itself, you know, a couple of years later. And I also mentioned the Chernobyl disaster in 1986, which is on record the world's worst nuclear disaster. Um, thousands of lives were lost. Countless uh, birth defects uh, have, you know, happened, you know, after that years and years and years, you continue to see birth, de uh, birth uh, defects. And it's also estimated to be several times the amount of radiation that was released in Chernobyl in 1986, uh, several times worse than uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, uh, the bombing of Japan back then. So, um, two things that I'll quickly mention for, for this is, first of all, well, let me go to the bad one first. Um, I don't. I always try to imagine the worst scenarios, you know, that could possibly happen in Nigeria and how we would handle them. Do we have systems that would be able to evacuate 100,000 people and keep them safe? Do we have a healthcare system that will be able to um, uh, monitor and to uh, take care of people that have been exposed to that level of radiation? Mm -hmm. Uh, do we have any, you know, of, of that? Do we have a government that would be responsive on that level? The second one is, the positive side of it now, is to be thankful that we also don't have new, those level of um, 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 disasters, you know, that happen here in Africa. We don't have earthquakes of that magnitude. We don't have tsunamis. We don't have, um, you know, very, very serious tornadoes and, and the like. So that's one thing that we've been blessed with as a continent. Um, they say that our own disasters are our leaders, and they're the ones who, of course, um, you know, yeah. create the disasters that you know, the rest of the world gets to see you know, um, you know, from Mother Earth. Hmm. I am just thankful that it seems that the era of all these you know, bombings and nuclear wars are all over, you know, and I hope that stays the same way for Hopefully. good. And uh, this day in history, we're going back to the year 1997, and it was at this day in history that Paul McCartney of the Beatles uh, became knighted. Uh, he was uh, a former member of the most successful rock band in history, and we're talking about the Beatles. He was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II for his services to music. 
So it was a ceremony that held at the Buckingham Palace in central London. And tickets for that event was 24 shillings. And just a few people were able to afford that. Fans, you know, were very excited about the event. But eventually, you know, he left the Beatles from his own group called Wings with his former wife, uh, Linda. And uh, he's very old now, but he's, he's still very uh, remarkable when it comes to music. I mean, he's, he's released a new body of work right now. And you won't even believe just how much uh, uh, response and how much acceptance the fans are giving him many, many years after. After so the that's, Beatles. Yes, yeah, that's basically it. He's an English song singer, songwriter, musician, record producer. He's gained worldwide fame as a coded uh, vocalist and bassist for the Beatles. Um, I saw, um, I'm just going to say this before we go. I saw uh, a conversation um, on, I think it was the Daily Show, or I'm not sure who, what show it was now, mm -hmm. where uh, someone was asked, you know, in, in, in the wake of all the, you know, the allegations lately um, from uh, the British, um, um, well, if he's going to um, write the okay. racism in the yeah, um, if they the will, Palace. you know, still be willing to accept, you know, the um, honors, you know, being knighted and, and the likes, you know, and there's a couple of people who feel that they they will not, you know, accept any of those um, honors uh, being called sir this and sir that, you know, the one of the most popular ones, of course, is uh, Sir Alex Ferguson. Um, but there's people who would argue currently that if they, you know, cause through their uh, maybe sports and achievements, music achievements, movies and the, li and the like, um, are called to be knighted by the British Empire, that they very likely would turn it down. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the, the things that um, our guest yesterday um, had spoken about, the effect of Harry and Meghan on the uh, British Empire and how really it, it might affect them in the long run. Would you turn it down? If you had to be rewarded for your services on TV in journalism, <laughs> no, <worry>. no. <laughs> I will kneel down so fast. Oh my god! <laughs> and no wait way. for the sword to touch your shoulder. Right? Absolutely. All right. Um, we'll uh, take a break here and return with our first big conversation. Do stay with us. <laughs> 